evening. As a UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. I'm David Hansen. For those of you who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member <clears throat> in a discussion with you, the local community of the Silicon Valley and our extended community online all with the goal of making us Renaissance people. We want it to feel like, just like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks and without tests. Mike Creepy, another volunteer organizer is with me tonight. We're both alumni and spend our working days in growing companies, Silicon Valley style. He'll be one helping me with the Q and A and you'll hear more from him at the end. However, right now he'll do the honors and lead us through the an acknowledgement for Indigenous Peoples Day. Mike? Yeah, thank you, David. As David said, today is Indigenous Peoples Day. This was established as a federal holiday by President Biden just last year. And in recognition, I'd like to start the evening by reading the UC Santa Cruz land acknowledgement. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe the Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and to heal from historical trauma. Thank you, Mike. Before we go on, and since we can't see you, We'd like to know where you're coming in from and how many people you're watching with. A poll should have popped up on your screen. Please take a moment to fill it out. And we'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Aha, now you should see the results. Uh, a few, two of us, Santa Cruz County, outside the United States, 10%, highly respectable. 35% outside of California, wonderful. So we will be tipping our steins this evening with Associate Professor Catherine Kate Ringland of UCSC's Baskin School of Engineering and its Computational Media Department, where she leads the MISFIT lab. Now, if she doesn't explain what a, a lab has to do to be MISFIT, someone please ask her later. Kate received her PhD in informatics from the University of California, Irvine, building on a BS in psychology from Washington State University. Her areas of research, include human-computer interaction, game studies, and critical disability studies. Past affiliations include the ASSIST lab at UC Santa Cruz, the Center for Behavioral Intervention Technologies, and the People, Information, and Technology Changing Health lab, that's pitch lab, at Northwestern University. Finally, the star group in Lucy at the ICS School. She is the recipient of the best paper awards and nominations from four respected professional organizations. Now we'll address questions at the end of the talk, but don't wait until the last minute. You can type them in at any time down in the Q&A box at the bottom. Now, if you see somebody else's question and you like it, you can upload it and that one will be asked sooner. This talk is being recorded. You'll be able to find it later in a few days on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lecture YouTube channel. We'll post that link in our social media channels and follow up emails. Okay, does everyone have their sign? Hold up your sign. Great, I've got your slug, Kate Ringland. 
Thank you. All right, let me get my slides up. Right. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, yes, so tonight I'm going to be talking about playing in online caring communities, and I'm going to explain what all that means in just a minute. We all belong to many different communities in our lives. We have communities in our families, our workplaces, our places of spirituality, and our hobbies. We're social beings. These communities are important because this is where we build our relationships, it's where we socialize, it's where we express our various identities. And communities are where we receive care. It's where we get support when we've had a rough day, when we're struggling, and it's also where we go to celebrate when good things have happened. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a particular kind of community. So imagine a community that's based in fun, that's based in play. This might be a community that's built around a hobby or some, some place that people go that they wanna participate in in their leisure time. So the fun, the play becomes the foundation of the community. Relationships are built off having a good time together. Play becomes the catalyst for bringing people together. Now imagine this is also a community that actively practices caring for its members, for each other. A community where people go to feel safe and supported. And in fact, the foundation of play in that community makes caretaking practices possible. And finally, now imagine that this community exists primarily online in digital spaces. Perhaps community members meet offline in person occasionally, but the majority of the community, most of the time, interacts online. All that play, all the caring that the community engages in happens in places on the internet. So why would we care about such communities? Well, these are communities that people spend their time in. Whether face-to-face -face or online, the communities are practicing both the playfulness and care, and it's, acting, it's impacting real life people globally. So by understanding these communities, we can know how these communities are impacting their members. And how these communities use various technology, apps, and digital platforms gives us an important lesson in how to better support positive social impact on people who go online. So we can learn what tools these communities are using, what the workarounds and the changes they're making to particular platforms are to better serve their community members. And we can start to get a picture for how to better design these tools in the future. Which brings us to the topic today. Um, as introduced, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Computational Media here at UC Santa Cruz. And I study how playful communities engage in practices of care. So my work entails long-term ethnographic work within communities, which means I spend a lot of time being a part of these communities to better understand their practices, relationships, and culture. And I've now conducted research within two seemingly very different kinds of communities that engage in both play and care. And both these communities fit the description that I just had us all imagining moments ago, this community that is founded on play activities, committed to caring for one another in, in their group, and also all of these social activities primarily occurring online. So with that, I'm gonna just dive right in and give some, uh, tell some stories about what is actually happening in these communities. So the first community that I'm going to be talking about today is the Otcraft community. Otcraft, um, according to them, is the first ever Minecraft server dedicated to providing a safe, fun learning environment for children on the autism spectrum and their families. It's run completely by parent volunteers and is sustained from donations by community members. So it's a self-sustaining community. The community welcomes children with autism, their family and friends. So Minecraft, for those who don't know, is sort of like 
digital Legos, if you will. So it's this customizable, open-ended, creative space where players can interact with blocks. Um, they can kind of build and take down and rebuild, and then they can interact with one another. Um, as you're seeing here, this is actually my brother and I playing together. So what's nice about Minecraft is that it's accessible for the novice user. It doesn't require programming skills to create new things. Um, and the learning curve is just a lot less steep than other uh, virtual worlds. This makes it especially great for younger children um, as then they can interact without having um, to do too much in terms of typing and things. Um, there's already infrastructure in place for in-world socializing, as you can see here with avatar interactions, and there's also um, text-based chat. So the Autcraft community uses a variety of platforms, including social media, um, and they have their own forums and website. But the driving platform, the central platform in their community, of course, is Minecraft. Um, Minecraft, the community uses the Minecraft platform and then augments it to tailor the experience of the game for community members. This is important because how many of the community members, so that is autistic youth, how they're interacting with the technology might be different than other players. And I'm gonna get into that more in a moment. So autistic children are often considered antisocial or not interested in making friends. And this is because these children often have a very difficult time with face-to-face -face interactions and conversations. The amount of information might be overwhelming. Um, there's lots of stress and anxiety around these types of interactions. But social play and socializing is an important part of childhood. It's how children develop, practice their social skills. It's how they engage in a wide range of these playful practice roles. Um, it's how children learn to test the boundaries of social rules and norms. And these playful interactions are vital not only for children to grow into competent adults, but also to discover who they are and what kind of adults they want to become. So for autistic children who may have non-normative ways of interacting with their peers, they often find themselves being bullied at school, singled out because they're different. Um, and what's even worse is these kids are then, um, who are then being isolated at school are also going online to find friends and play games only to meet more bullies and trolls. And I'm sure everyone here has had some kind of experience with someone saying something inappropriate or mean to them on the internet. Um, we do a lot, we have our own practices for keeping ourselves safe, like not reading the comments on specific news articles, staying off social media when there's been a big event. Um, th these are kind of the norms here. But for our autistic children in particular, as with other marginalized groups, um, they tend to get targeted because of who they are. So especially in places like gamer spaces, you'll see autistic or autism actually being used in a derogatory way towards these kids. So ableism, that is the discrimination against disabled individuals, is prevalent throughout society. And whether intentional or not, acts of ableism are acts of violence. And this violence causes trauma, not only for those who are experiencing it, um, but this is important because we design these spaces for children to play in. We have to be aware of the ableism that might take place there. Um, and this is especially meaningful as research has shown that the experiences that someone is having in these online spaces can be just as impactful to someone as what is happening in a physical space. So unfortunately, being bullied, threats of violence, um, all of this, um, you know, has the potential to harm anyone who's dealing with that. Um, and it can, you know, lead to acts of further harm on the, on the individual experience that. And games, multiplayer games, have the same problem as any other large scale social platforms. 
These are open worlds where many people can play together at once. They're full of social experiences where communities are created, norms are developed and occur, rules are both made and broken between players. And autistic kids find themselves being bullied in these spaces, um, often because they, the players are unmoderated um, and we have things like ableism. So you might, you might hear a story about a kid who's worked really hard to build a castle in Minecraft and then somebody comes along and knocks it down. Um, you have other kids who have been called names or just being told how different they are. So this ends up kind of uh, being just like the schoolyard all over again for these kids. Um, and as a gamer, I know how toxic some of these gaming communities can be. Um, but I also know that there is a potential here and, um, and an actuality of these spaces also being truly positive places for people to connect. So when I heard about Botcraft as a researcher, I knew I wanted to find out more about it. Uh, I, I wanted to know what does this community actually look like? How exactly um, were they playing together? What made this place so special? So. Um, to learn more, I created my own Minecraft avatar, which you can see on this slide. Um, I named myself Researcher Kate, uh, and my brother actually designed this avatar for me uh, with the white lab coat and kind of matches my brown hair and green eyes. Uh, but I wanted to kind of be like scientists. So that's what this avatar is supposed to be telling you, in case you're wondering. Um, and because this uh research takes place online it's easier to do this sort of thing where you can kind of create your persona and in this case i wanted to make sure that people kind of knew i might be there for a reason to evoke curiosity in the kids um, i really wanted to engage them in conversations um and it was nice to be able to kind of do that in a way that was somewhat unobtrusive but still kind of gave myself some visibility so who, who plays in the Otcraft community? Um, they're mainly preteens who identify with autism or similar neurodevelopmental disorders. Otcraft also includes a range of community members from children as young as six all the way through to adults. And at the time of my work, Otcraft had well over 14,000 approved or whitelisted players. Uh, one rule of the server is that everyone speaks English, um, and that's for moderation purposes. However, users come across from all over the globe. So large groups coming from North America, the United Kingdom, and Australia. To get access to the community, there is a whole vetting process, which culminates in an individual being placed on the whitelist or the approved player list, which allows them access to the actual game. And this gatekeeping practice ensures that players have a connection to the autistic community, meaning they have autism or a family member or a close friend has autism. And typically the vetting process occurs when individuals describe their connection to autism um, in their little application. And then they also have to agree to follow the rules of the community. So allowing um, only those with a direct connection to the autistic community helps ensure safety of all community members by um, giving them a safe space to allow players to express their differences without the fear or without repercussion of things like stigma. And not only are they checked to make sure they have connections to the autistic community, they're also, uh, they're, their usernames and things are vetted for making sure that they don't have a record for trolling other servers or hacking um, into game world. Um, so they check the username against kind of a known list of, of uh, troublesome players. And um, this is the one group of people who are explicitly excluded from the Otcraft community. And that's people who wish to harm autistic players. So when I looked at the Otcraft community, I found that while the children were primarily there to play, they were also doing a lot of work 
um, on themselves and with each other to come to an understanding about their own identities, make friends, to find support and safety. So the, the kind of the culmination of this talk, you, if you will, is this that, that play can both be purposeful, it can have a purpose, but it can also be joyfully purposeless. So they're doing work through play, but they're also just there to have fun and play. So let me dig into a little bit more about how the community members feel about being in the, in the Aircraft community. So this was from the forum on their website. Um, one player wrote, so I don't ever socialize. I only, I, the only way I'm social is online. I never hang out with my family or do anything. The only time I come out of my room is if we watch a family movie, I play baseball, we go for a car ride, or I go to work. Other than that, I'm in my room 24 seven on the PC, YouTube, texts, et cetera. Is anyone else like this? Will I always be not social? I really want to be social, but it's hard. So while not understanding why he doesn't socialize, this community member in particular describes a myriad of social activities that he's actually engaging in. And in response to this post, another community member posted, even being on Otcraft is social. So for many on Otcraft, being helpful and supportive is one of the most important parts of their sociality in that space. So the community has found it important enough to write into their rules and actively encourage pro-social behavior through things like rewarding members. Um, there's titles like player of the week. Um, and these kids describe hanging out with their friends on Otcraft, virtual, the like in the virtual world, much like that they, they would hang out with um, youth offline. So they spend time with their Otcraft friends hanging out by interacting through the forums, through instant messaging, but also just being phys physically, virtually um, in the Otcraft space. Um, so although not typically physically co-located, they do consider the relationships and the activities that they're doing to be really meaningful to them. And as some of the community members found before joining Otcraft, um, they, they talk about kind of some of the, the problems they would have and how coming to the Otcraft community was somewhat of a relief. So this person was talking to me in the world. They were, they were showing me around their, their building. Um, and they were talking about what it was like when they had been on other, uh, community servers. So they said, people would swear and call me names and break my builds, et cetera because I'm different. I didn't realize people would be mean about their username. And I like the name. There's other people on here on the Otcraft server with autism or autistic in their name. And they had actually had some kind of username that implied that they had autism and that was kind of them showing off their identity. And they were able to come to the Otcraft community and actually be able to embrace that. Um, so in response, so in response to someone um, on the Otcraft forums um, asking for help in making friends, uh, one of the community members replied, I guess that's what Otcraft is for, meeting people who go through the same thing as you so you don't feel alone. So a lot of the kind of the social experience that the community members were having were ones of feeling support and togetherness, but doing it in a way that they could, um, you know, that they'd be playing at the same time. So this this image that you're seeing on the screen here, it, the, this was a player that was showing me around their different um, buildings that they had created. And this one was one where this child had led a team of other players to actually build this whole mansion, which is what you're seeing here is this big wooden mansion. It's quite large. It goes farther back than you can see in this uh, screenshot. But the the this was a lot of what they would do together. They'd get together, figure out that what they want to build, and then they would play. Uh, one parent actually created this entire university um, where they had a bunch of different classrooms and informational things posted on the walls. So here you're seeing this. Um, this Professor Enderman is a is a statue here. 
Um, and not pictured here is the other kind of positive messaging that's written on the walls. So for example, um, one of the classroom signs read, what's the problem with body listening? Eye contact can be physically painful for some. You don't have to look to be good at listening. Your ears can do their job all by themselves. Sometimes verbal stims help to process and that's okay. If making sounds helps you listen and learn. Flappy hands, happy hands. Your boundaries are just as important as anyone else's. Your brain is always thinking even when others don't understand. You are awesome just the way you are. Your heart is caring about others and you deserve the same. So this was this was posted in a classroom for kids to start kind of learning about their own uh, bodies and their own experiences and to find some validation in that. Another room contained uh, this statue of Larry um, and the signs read, uh, this is Larry. Larry used to shame autistics about whole body listening, but now he knows better. Larry is working on his assumptions about autistics. Share this with others to help them learn. So here, Larry is this representative person of somebody, most likely outside the Opcraft community that players probably know in their lives. So perhaps Larry is a fellow student or the dentist or a grocery store clerk. Autistic players often run into people in their daily lives, judging them for their behavior that might seem strange or different. But in this school, in this university, there's this lesson here of how to speak up and advocate for themselves, how to educate Larry uh, so that he understands autistic people better and stops judging them. So within the art craft community, there's this very strong sense of identity, of the autistic identity. And throughout the world and throughout all the different kinds of play, you can find messages of acceptance, understanding, and advocacy. And to help reinforce this, the Autcraft community has very specific rules that everyone follows in order to keep everyone safe. These include things like no name calling, no giving out private information. Uh, and as it says on their website, on Autcraft, we try to conduct ourselves based on three major principles, be kind, be respectful, and be responsible. Care in this community can take all kinds of different forms. So this might look like gift giving uh, within the world. It might be helping each other out on builds. It might be swapping homework tips on the forums. But one of my favorite memories from my time in Autcraft was watching a fireworks show with some other players. Um, so this was sometime during the holiday season. I think it might have been, um, uh, this would have been in summer. Um, but this happens a lot where they will host events like say for New Year's um, or Independence Day, where they'll have the kind of wide community wide fireworks show and the admin, ad, admin will uh, put on this whole show. But this particular time um, was not that. So this was put on by another player, um, most likely a, a preteen. Uh, so this was really late in the night where I was, and there were not very many players online. So there was probably less than 10, 10 players online at the time. It was very low uh, attendance at that at that that late at night. But in the chat, um, one of the players started announcing that there was going to be a fireworks show at the kind of the the main location where players log into the world. So come to spawn, and you can see a fireworks show. Um, and every minute after that, the player came back and was like, okay, five minutes until my fireworks show, four minutes until my fireworks show, and so on. So I, like basically everyone else on the server at the time, teleported to the area so that I could um, hang out and see what was going on. And as the time for the fireworks show um, approached, uh, the other players started counting down, and we all were kind of joining in in this kind of group text chat countdown. And then at the time of launch, he, he lit off all his fireworks um, and everyone was watching and cheering in the chat and jumping around. And, um, and it was just like a really joyful experience. Um, and there was no real catalyst for this, right? It, there was no particular event for this to happen. 
And making fireworks in Minecraft is not actually that easy. It takes a lot of different materials you have to gather. And so knowing that this player actually put quite a lot of effort into making this show for us and then sharing it with us was um, quite a special thing. And it's one of those memories that I really cherish um, from my time with the community. So the Autocraft community is this wonderful example of a place that allows children to come and play together free of harassment and bullying. And it's a community that leverages that play to then educate and empower its community members. So all of this is done on this, on primarily virtual platforms, connecting community members from all over the globe. With that, I'd like to now turn to our second example which is another community that also engages in playful interactions and caretaking on a variety of uh, social platforms. And we'll see that it's a little bit different, but also kind of the same. So, um, the community that I'm now gonna be talking about is ARMY. So pictured here, you're actually seeing BTS, which if you haven't heard of them, is a band of musicians from South Korea uh, and they're posing here in suits holding their diplomatic passports. Um, and ARMY is the name of the fandom for BTS. ARMY has been growing in size consistently since BTS's debut in 2013. As a community, ARMY uses a variety of social media platforms to communicate. The community is composed of a diverse but often underrepresented majority. And they are largely misunderstood as a community. Um, they experience a lot of bias and stereotyping. And as community members, they also experience their own forms of oppression because of their various intersecting identities across um, kind of the, the different places that people are from and the, and the different ways they identify it. There is no current real number for how many ARMY are actually out there, but it's in the millions. Um, just as a rough, rough estimate, BTS, to just exemplify, BTS has 47.5 million followers on Twitter and 71 million followers on YouTube and I got those numbers today. So those are those are their followers and kind of give you a sense, even if ARMY is technically a fraction of that, it's still quite a few people. So in this work, this is um, ongoing ethnographic work that I'm doing in the community. Um, much like in the Autocraft study, I'm doing participant observation in ARMY online spaces. However, this time I'm doing it as a member researcher. So I'm actually a member of ARMY and I'm doing this as a member researcher. The majority of ARMY activity um, that I'm observing happens primarily on Twitter, but there's also engagement on any social media platform that you can name. Um, but for the sake of my, my resources and time, and because of the particular sub-communities that I uh, um, am in, I spend most of my time on Twitter, and then I do have some observations from TikTok, Weverse, VLive, and YouTube. Um, and because of this, the way this is set up, I'm relying on my own nodes of the community. So I'm obviously not observing millions of people. I'm, I'm observing my own sub-communities. Um, so to just give you a sense, I have people like mutual friends in these communities um, that at least some of the time speak in English. Um, the, my sub-communities tend to be LGBTQIA inclusive and they tend to be more adults. So this is less about children now and more about adults. And because this work relies on data from my online community, where I'm very transparent about my identity as a research and professor and army, that also influences some of the data that I collect. Um, so when army is referred to here, when I'm talking about army, <clears throat> I'm really specifically talking about my kind of extended community of army rather than army as a whole, because you really can't speak to army as a whole. There's just too many people. <laughs> um, but this starts kind of serves us as a, a great starting point for understanding the community and then, uh, you know, understanding our bigger question of what does playful caring community look like. 
So there's this quote that the community often refers to, and that is safety first, safety second, and coolness third, um, which is from one of the members of BTS. Um, and so I just want to clarify that safety of BTS and ARMY are the priority in conducting this research. So while this work is technically exempt um, from ethics approval, unlike the OCRAF study that was had much more rigor in terms of ethics approval because it was working with kids, this involves a lot of just really public social media. Um, however, uh, uh, I took extra, I am taking extra care while collecting, analyzing, and presenting this data. Um, so as a member of the Army community, I take responsibility for protecting individuals who may interact with my various social media accounts. Um, the Army community has a fraught history of being marginalized, including incidents of racism, xenophobia, and ageism. And further, um, ARMY faces more criticism among media and outsiders, which we'll get to more in a minute. And because of this, um, there's a lot of concern about um, how I go about my research. So you'll see I don't use many direct quotes, um, for example, and that's just to kind of keep uh, the community safe. Okay, so within the community, BTS engages in and encourages playful activities through their conversations and content. So um, they, they're very playful, they're just very playful people. And, and then ARMY follows suit in fostering play um, in their own ways. So they do a lot of fan-made edits um, and commentary, a lot of role-playing, in-group humor. And BTS and ARMY engage in this play together to construct kind of this safe, enjoyable online community place for themselves. So I just wanted to talk for a minute about what play actually looks like when we're talking about a music fandom. I have uh, this fall, the following vignette describes kind of the, the, some of this play in the lead up to the release of the remix of their song Butter featuring Megan Thee Stallion. So on the eve of the remix release, prior to the song being publicly available, ARMY on Twitter began changing their profile pictures and header images to match this kind of garishly pink color that was featured in the teaser video for the remix. So you can see here it says butter and then there's a swirling pink behind it. Um, and so everyone kind of took hold of that pink and said, okay, this is gonna be the dress code for the song release. And so what they did is you can see here, my original profile picture features Jimin in the foreground with a tree in the background. And then um, we erase the background and add this pink heart situation going on and keep Jimin in the foreground. So what you have is a bunch of profile pictures all down the Twitter timeline that all feature this really like prominently pink color. Um, and a couple hours before launch, uh, Meg Stallion tweeted a picture of herself in this dark green dress. Um, some already started joking that maybe we had all gotten the color scheme wrong and some people even momentarily switched their accounts to green. Um, so then we have this really bizarre pink and green thing going on. Um, eventually, she actually then updated her profile on Twitter to match the pink. Um, as you can see here in this slide, so she, she posts, uh, this is of her posting the link to the song, but you can see in her little profile picture um, up in the corner there that she actually adopted the same pink background that everyone else was using. So with the music release, um, it was released at noon in South Korea. Um, everyone on Twitter, ARMY on Twitter, began wondering why BTS hadn't adhered to the dress code. Um, they wanted to know how come they were still in their, their yellow, black and white header. Um, and it took a while, but several hours after the release, somebody in BTS finally did change their profile picture um, and header to kind of match the pink aesthetic that everyone else was going for. Um, so the celebration could finally really truly commence because everybody was finally in the correct attire. So being part of the ARMY community meant 
um, in a survey that I conducted, um, one army answered, I feel um, home and safe. Being an army allows me to connect to people in a different and deeper way without feeling judged. Because of BTS and army, I can't feel lonely. And another person responded, I'm part of a great force of loving people. So again, like with Autcraft, there's a lot of talk about feeling at home, feeling this is our family, feeling that connection and support. And when describing what being in the Army community meant, um, there were lots of different words that came up. So supporting, love, respect, um, acceptance, positive, compassion. So a lot of really positive, supportive words um, that Army uses to kind of talk about this relationship. So what does playfully caring look like? Um, so ARMY plays a lot with content. So what you're seeing here is a bunch of different kind of collected content around BTS holding fans. Um, but the label for this is BTS and the only kinds of fans they should be seeing outside their public schedules. So um, this is a curational thread that brings together BTS content, but it also serves the educational purpose of telling ARMY and highlighting that ARMY should not be bothering BTS when they're not truly public, when they're trying to like live their private lives. Um, so in this way, ARMY does what they do best by creating playful content, but also using that to kind of exemplify the ways in which they can care for other ARMY and also for BTS. All right, and I wanted to share just another fun way that ARMY plays with content. This is actually something I did, but it, it's it featured a lot in a lot of different um, places on Twitter. So this is this I'm going to first play the original clip of BTS, uh, three of the members of BTS uh, dancing to part of the Butter remix that I was just talking about. Move like the car I ride, even your best party planner couldn't catch this vibe. Big boss, and I make a hate to stay on their job, and I be on these girls' necks like the back of their box. Houston's finest in the room with bouses. Make them all get ratchet in their suits and blouses. I remember writing flows in my room in college. Now I need global entry to the shows I'm rocking. Smooth like cocoa butter, my drink more than a puddle. They know that I'm the way. Take over every summer. They must be giving Stevie if they ever had to wonder. Cause every beat I get on get turned into hubba bubble. So then what community does is then they will remix things or they'll edit videos together and, and do different things. But I wanted to share like one of the fun remixes was people putting um, classical music together with BTS dancing. Um, so this example is the pot of cat from Swan Lake. So there's lots of different ways that ARMY kind of engages a variety of different kind of playful practices here. But sometimes um, it's easier to understand uh, kind of play by looking at the boundaries of it. Uh, this shows up in ARMY spaces in a few different ways. So for example, uh, while the ARMY community can be very fun and playful, there's also a seriousness about supporting BTS. This means listening to their music, doing radio requests, supporting voting for various music awards, and so on. An army is also very serious about its altruism. So, for example, when BTS quietly donated a million dollars to Black Lives Matters in the spring of 2020, army decided to match that donation with their own crowdsourced one million dollars, and army made headlines at the time for being able to raise those funds in just over 24 hours. So, while this was a large donation that made the news. Army is kind of consistently doing this kind of supporting charities and various um, uh, public works and crowdsourcing funds um, for different events. So Army takes their cues from BTS to draw boundaries around what content is considered playful and what content is not. 
So Army uses these cues to construct fairly strict boundaries that fans do not cross. So they um, Army won't use very specific um, serious pictures or videos for a meme or humor. And they make sure that BTS and ARMY get credit where they deserve for their creative work. So here, humor and satire has its limits and ARMY um, are pretty quick to call out people who have crossed the line, um, especially when things like microaggressions or racism in disguise can damage an artist's reputation. Um, so the following vignette I, uh, describes one such instance where an outsider attempted humor and was quickly kind of called out by ARMY. So during the week of the Grammys, which is one of the Western music industry's award shows, a toy company created images to be printed as cards or stickers of various music musicians that had been nominated for awards. So these cards were meant to be kind of humorous. So there was a cartoon version of the musician Taylor Swift dressed in, she was dressed in moss and laying on a tree branch with a microphone. However, the only artists and only Asians that were depicted in kind of a violent way, so they had um, bruises and bandages on their face, um, and they were appearing in the holes you can see on the screen here, the holes of a whack-a-mole um, arcade game was BTS. So these cards were um, advertised across different social media, um, including being retweeted by the official Grammy um, award account. Um, so ARMY very quickly mobilized to create a campaign that kind of denounced the kind of racist depiction of BTS and asked for it to be removed. So the toy company did eventually remove the items for sale. Their apology was terse at best and the depictions are still available everywhere on the internet. Like I, I was able to find this months later. So while racism would have been inappropriate at any time, um, these, this particular incident occurred um, during a time when violence against Asian Americans was kind of coming to an all time high in the West. Um, and it was quite prevalent in the news at the time. In fact, within 24 hours of the release of those cards, eight people were killed, six of them Asian women in a shooting in Atlanta, Georgia. So, Armies here believe that the Grammys had misused the size of Army for views um, while simultaneously mistreating BTS. So kind of this, um, this feeling of being used by outside institutions because of the size and kind of pull of the fandom. So Army demanded that all the images be retracted and they eventually were. Um, but the incident is something that people still remember and talk about. So BTS are global stars and as such, um, outsiders um, of the community do notice and they notice ARMY because ARMY kind of has its own fame and its own right for being so large. Um, and this attention is definitely not always positive. So while there is time for play, there's also this tacit acknowledgement that all of this playful place is also happening in real life. So just as ARMY is engaging in these playful pretend activities, they're very aware of the fact that they are also being kind of globally viewed and recognized. So they know that people can see them when they're doing things in public. What's interesting about this is, you, is ARMY is using the practices that they engage their kind of playfulness in. So all this playful content, the spreading their playful images and edits and so on. Um, they use the same practices then to also spread serious content. So they're employing these kind of practiced networks to quickly spread messaging about an event, um, about bad things happening, such as the racist depiction of BTS. And to help, this helps raise awareness um, and, and, and hopefully have a positive outcome in the end, but they're employing these kind of same um, kind of behaviors, um, both for playfulness and then seriousness. So I wanted to share one final example before I wrap up here. 
Um, this is very, very recent, as in uh, this was October 3rd, so a week ago. Um, uh, an outsider of the community um, who is a person who has a very public platform um, was on air and referred to the Army community as BTS nerds. And this was interpreted in tone and in the context of the conversation as being um, somewhat derogatory. People were meant to be offended by this. Um, so instead of drawing attention to that outsider, ARMY rallied on Twitter to um, kind of celebrate and explain the different ways in which um, they are BTS nerds. So the hashtag BTS nerds began trending online. And as people kind of poured into this, uh, poured posts into this hashtag, the reason for this and the person who initially used the term kind of just became quickly forgotten, kind of faded into the background as people were kind of just celebrating this term. So for example, people came in and they, you know, they talked about their higher degrees. They talked about their interests in a variety of niche topics like Dungeons and Dragons and literature and fiber crafts and programming languages. Um, there's there people were talking about their different careers in engineering, healthcare, um, and most importantly, they were kind of sharing their love for BTS and the Army community together. So playing together and this idea of social play requires a feeling of safety, whether you're actually safe or not, and trust between the players. So you can't really have this kind of community of play without these um, components. And so for ARMY, for example, almost all these playful activities are occurring on these very public platforms that can be accessed by outsiders at any time. However, ARMY still holds to the trust among each other and in BTS as they go about their play and continue to tackle these real world issues. Um, so for example, Twitter has this um, thing where they put post descriptive summaries when things are trending. Um, and this can go one of two ways. It can be uh, fine and dandy, or it can be uh, misrepresentative and potentially harmful. And so ARMY has to kind of keep track of what's going on with these things um, to know whether their play is being misinterpreted by outsiders. So when to be playful and when not to be is really context dependent here and both the both considering the context inside and outside of the community. And outside the playful community, um, a lot of kind of the antics and humor that's going on can be misunderstood and stigmatized. Um, so a lot of this can be seen in how community members negotiate with one another about what's appropriate for the timeline. So what's appropriate to put um, out publicly, what should be reserved for kind of private backroom conversations in, in direct messaging and so forth. So for the play here to be truly playful, there has to be trust between the members of the community and it needs to be developed to kind of create this sense of consent and safety um, in order for the play to actually be fun. And the same can be said of the art craft community. So the children can't feel safe to, for, to play if they're, if they're facing toxic play environments or are in vulnerable positions with regards to expressing their identities. Both communities use a variety of public and private platforms to create these places of safety, trust, and consent in order to have a playfully caring community experience. And this work shows the ways in which these communities foster care and relationships through play using a variety of technological platforms available to them. So these relationships can then flourish not only in online spaces, but offline as well. We can see this through local meetups in the Autcraft community, as well as lots of different in-person events in the Army community, including large scale concerts. And I want to highlight while these two communities, the Autcraft community for autistic youth and the ARMY community for fans of, a Kore of the Korean band BTS, 
They seem quite different from one another, but they also share many similarities. As communities, they are misunderstood and have faced harsh treatment from outsiders. Community members have come to rely on one another as support um, for support and understanding. And both of these communities have reach. They have the power to impact thousands of individuals across the globe. So most importantly, most importantly, both communities are based in fun, playful engagements. These engagements become the basis for um, the ways in which community members take care of one another. And again, importantly, showing us that play can be purposeful, but it can also be joyfully purposeless. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending this talk and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, this is Mike Reapy. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody, uh, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, David and I will be reading the questions. Um, I'd like to, first question is from Misha. Uh, she's, uh, Misha is wondering if you attended the recent BTS research conference in Seoul, and if so, can you speak about that experience, or if not, are you aware of it? Yes, I did. I presented there, actually, some of this work that you just, <laughs> that you just got to launch. So now you too have uh, attended the BTS conference in Seoul. Um, no, it was a, it was a really lovely experience because it was all um, people who um, are interested in um, understanding BTS, understanding ARMY, and you know, we kind of all came together and we got to um, nerd out, if you will, about um, being in the fandom. And it was, yeah, and it was a, it was a truly wonderful experience to actually be in a room with other researchers who understood my topic without me having to explain the basics. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lisa wonders uh, if you could explain a little about your origin story in becoming ARMY. <laughs> um, so I became ARMY during the pandemic, um, early in the pandemic. Um, uh, I, like many, many people who joined ARMY, I was feeling quite lost. Um, this was before I became a professor. I was doing a postdoc at the time. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And I wasn't really, things felt very uncertain. Um, and so it was kind of the culmination of, you know, I found them at the right time and the their music and lyrics really helped me through a lot of kind of the the darkness that, that I was feeling at the time. And um, so, yeah, so then I kind of fell into BTS and then I discovered ARMY and that was a whole nother experience of like, finding a community that understood that kind of journey and understood um, what it felt like to have that community support. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll remind everybody again, uh, we'd love to hear your questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask one of my own. I'm uh, curious, uh, like how the, especially the the Otcraft community, how that is sort of advertised. Is it just completely grassroots? Uh, how do how do people get the word out? Yeah, so originally um, back in 2012, 2013, when it was founded, um, it was just a dad with um, autistic kid who he had a blog. So he had a bit of a following, a couple hundred people. Um, and the first week he, he posted in his blog, I think I'm going to start this server because my kid's getting bullied on other servers, et cetera. Um, and within the first week, he had 750 people interested. And so it really truly was grassroots in that it was like, wow, there's a need for this. I guess I need to fill it. Um, and it kind of just kept exploding from there. Um, yeah. Oh. Okay, Delia uh, wonders about BTS and ARMY and whether they have different games for autistic kids of different levels, mild or serious. I'd like to expand it if you don't mind. Uh, do they segment army in any manner and, and have separate sections for different types of people, if you will? Um, um, let me think how to answer that question. I, I, think, I think the original question is more towards does Otcraft have different um, segregations, if you will, for different autistic kids. 
I think is the actual question there. And the answer is no. Um, everyone just plays in the same space, but how kids play, um, it looks different across different kids. So every kid is different and, and every kid who comes in might want to engage differently depending on the day and how they're feeling and stuff. So um, I had, I was playing with kids that didn't, didn't write in the text chat at all, for instance, they just hung out with me and we just ran around and built stuff together kind of without, you know, being verbal, if you will. Um, I played with kids who just wanted to dig holes. So they just, they were just digging and that was just cool. That's what they did. And then to all these, to the, these kind of elaborate creations that the other kids were building. And so it really was just kind of a gamut of who was engaging and, and kind of where they were. And it's just, it's a, it's a huge, Minecraft is a huge, huge world. It, take, it would take days and days of real life time to walk from one end to the other. So it, um, people are just kind of spread out doing their own thing in there. Now we have a question from Vicky. Is there a relationship between uh, Autcraft and groups like Autism Speaks, et cetera? I'm not familiar with that one. I hope you are. Um, yeah, uh, not really um, that I know of. So, so a lot of kind of the more formal organizations around autism tend to have very specific agendas that tend to be a little different than Autcraft's particular agenda. Autcraft tends to be very autism positive and embracing um, autism the way you want to be autistic. Um, whereas organizations like Autism Speaks tend to be more concerned about things like integration and just into normative society and stuff. So, so there's, there's, there's not that, that I know of, there hasn't been a lot of interaction between those groups, no. Okay, we have a question about what you think the advantages are of Autcraft compared to other online collaborative games. Yeah, so I think the like big thing about Autcraft is one, um, the the platform itself. So Minecraft as a game um, was built to be uh, augmented. It was built to be modified. Um, there's a whole huge modding community that just, that's what they do is they just build mods to the game. Um, so when the game was originally built, that was the intent was like, here's a base game, do with it what you want. Um, so one of the advantages for Autcraft then is that they've done that. They've, they've taken various mods and they've had some kind of homegrown mods that they've created themselves. And they've really tailored the game experience for their players, so for the autistic kids. Um, so that's one big advantage. And then the second big advantage being that the community itself, so the people. So um, it really takes the social infrastructure and the social experience to really make or break a game, to make or break a community experience, right? So, so that is the kind of advantage, if you will, of a place like Autcraft, which they've really they've iterated and put a lot of thought into the social experience of what's happening in the game. A uh, question from Joel. Can you discuss similarities between Autcraft and any sub-communities in Animal Crossing? I, I don't know specifically much. I know that there's some really awesome Animal Crossing communities. Um, the gameplay is obviously very different. So, you know, the thing with Autcraft is you have to like to play Minecraft. And if you don't like playing Minecraft, then obviously that's not going to work for you. You need to find something else. Um, and the gameplay between those two games is quite different, but um, yeah, I imagine that um, there's actually quite some potential in Animal Crossing because I've heard of some really great kind of family run communities around that. Uh, can you elaborate on what some of us aren't familiar with Animal Crossing? So Animal Crossing is, is um, it's less about building. It's you, you live in a little community with like kind of other little animals and, you do work for them and you can clean up your place and you can expand and um, kind of have your own little, like essentially like a little farm and things. Like you build your, build out your house and stuff, but you're not building. So it's not like Legos. It's more like just a place, a virtual world that is built for you essentially. Um, so there's more, it's more about the kind of the interactions between your, the little animals and the, and the players rather than 
the crafting that happens in Minecraft. Okay, I think there's an opening for my own question here. Uh, I happen to uh, be part of a, a company that has uh, educational primary as a purpose, but it also does a lot of community work. So all the, the children who are members in it can participate in an online community as part of that. And there's also games embedded in it as rewards for education. Anyway, the question is, were you, um, heading up a, an online community, uh, what are the key tools that can lead to more joyful, positive interaction? What are the tools you would make sure you'd have as a, an organization or as a site? It's an interesting question. I um, I think that uh, kind of one of the nice things about the Otcraft community with the with the Minecraft kind of base platform is that it allows for a lot of kind of creativity and flexibility in how the kids play. So kind of having tools that like mimic that in terms of, you know, kind of letting the kids interact and, and be creative how um, they how they work or play. Um, and, and the other thing I'll say to that is that, especially with the, with the art craft community, a lot of what they did, is they kind of were like, let the kids loose on the world, right? And then they kind of watched what they would do. So, um, for example, um, I didn't include this in my slides because I didn't have enough time. But for example, um, there were kids who would dig holes and essentially bury themselves inside. And so, um, one of the parents was like, what are you doing there? That's it's fascinating to watch you bury yourself, but why are you doing it? And they were saying, well, I needed a sensory break. So I needed like my screen to be dark for a little while, um, which in and of itself is a fascinating thing, right? But then what the ad admins decided to do with that is actually create sensory rooms inside the world. So then um, they built all these different kinds of sensory rooms. Some of them were dark rooms. Some of them were like peaceful gardens. There was a whole multi-sensory room with lights and, and different sounds and textures and things. And so the kids could teleport to that and give themselves a sensory break, if you will, um, without them having to actually detach from the game. So this was something that um, that they kind of iterated on and, and, and followed the lead of the kids. So a lot of the world is about what are the kids doing? What are the kids mean following their lead? And then you know, basically taking their play and actually then realizing their creativity play and making it more permanent in the world. Thank you. Well, now I have a, I have a question from Kay. Um, she's kind of curious how, uh, so I assume, and I'll maybe break down the third wall with you, you and your students, uh, you know, as you, you as a researcher, if you're, if you're working with graduate students uh, and Undergraduates, like what do uh, your students engage in? Um, excellent question. I do engage with students. Um, uh, for this work, it's been, uh, engagement is all over the place with, with this kind of work. Um, partly ethnography is hard, right? Because an ethnographer is the tool, they're the person that's doing the observing and collecting the data. So um, a, a lot of what I do is try to um use that as kind of a learning moment. This is what I'm doing. This is like kind of leading by example. Um, and then having students help me and go through the data with me afterwards. I do have some students that are army. So with the army research, it's actually been fun to kind of bring them in and, and help write the papers and stuff because they actually have their own experiences and, and um, can bring things to the table in terms of their own kind of data, if you will. Um, but then I also encourage my students to find their own communities and things that they're passionate about and, um, you know, conduct their own ethnographic work um, in the spaces that mean something to them. And that's kind of my ultimate goal is to, ha is to have them leading their own um, research. Hmm. Well, thank you. So, so if I could build on that, you, seen, you talked about data. I've seen quite a bit of uh, good qualitative observations. And Clearly, that's important. 
do you also do quantitative then? You know, what, 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 what does that look like? If- uh, I, yeah, I do not so much. Um, I have um, done some, we have some surveys where we've collected like demographic information and stuff, but we haven't really, I, I haven't really focused on quantitative so much. I could imagine a lot of things that quantitative uh, work could give us, especially when you start talking about like public social media, right? You can you can be, you know, counting hashtags and, and doing different things. Um, but I feel like this work is important to kind of bring more of the nuance to the table in terms of what are the stories behind what's actually happening, um, especially when you, when a lot of what people see are the headlines of like, you know, this is trending and this this many people did that and this broke broke records or whatever it is that's going on. This gives kind of the kind of the actual stories behind some of that and gives us um, more nuance to understand kind of the cultural impact of what these communities are doing. And we have we have a question from Vicky. Have your students looked at online crafting communities like knitting? We noticed uh, some of the BTS members knitting in that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I worked with some students at Northwestern, actually, that um, one of them worked with blind uh, weavers. So that was actually cool. They may actually went and made assistive tech for um, people who were doing weaving. And then, uh, and then I uh, also worked with a student, I mentored a student who um, did her dissertation work on Etsy and looking at how specifically disabled content or I guess creators, whatever, what would you call it? People who are making things, crafters, <laughs> um, people who craft, I don't know. Anyways, they, they were uh, how they kind of told their disability story um, while they were creating crafts that kind of supported them. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I, as a knitter, I just have personal experience in knitting communities, but I, I don't, none of us have actually studied them in earnest. No. <laughs> Misfit Lab, please explain. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's kind of uh, it comes from disability theory. Um, Rosemary Garner Thompson has this uh, theory of misfits and how the world is built for non-disabled people. And um, so when you experience disability, you experience this kind of the experience of misfitting and not quite fitting, you know, not being able to reach something or not being able to use the stairs or, you know, not being able to have a face-to-face conversation, whatever it is, you feel that sense of misfitting. And I don't know, we kind of embrace that idea as a lab of like, yes, this is how we feel, but we're gonna, you know, do something about it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd like to dig a little bit more into the research process. You, you touched on this before, but some of the, um, I forget what words you use, but especially in the odd craft community, right? What what sort of uh, university review boards? Uh, what sort of process do you have to follow, and how's that enforced? Yeah, so so with the odd craft work, with with the army work, it's all public, technically public data. So there is no review process really needed unless you start doing interviews and surveys and things, and that's kind of a more normal thing. But yeah, with the odd craft work. Um, it was both surprisingly complicated and surprisingly not complicated in different ways. So I was expecting more of a fight on certain things, um, but this was back in 2013. Times have changed. So, you know, your mileage may vary on what I'm about to say, but um, the, the, there were things I had to explain to the ethics board around like what a screenshot is or how I'm gonna anonymize this data, like the fact that I didn't capture any video data in the server, for example. So I don't, I didn't save um, usernames of the kids. I didn't, you know, I wasn't taking anything that could identify them later. Um, I was very careful about when pulling quotes to make sure it really wasn't like reverse searchable, things like that. But a lot of those practices I took on, the the ethics board didn't really consider. They were more worried about, um, you know, kids' private data being exposed, but I never really had access to that in the first place, so it didn't really matter. 
Um, so yeah, so it was one of those things, once I explained what, what I actually had access to, it actually became quite easy, but it was that getting to that point of having to explain. And I feel like maybe now that it's been almost a decade and technology has changed that it wouldn't be quite as hard, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think it's mm -hmm. it's nice to know that there are review boards out there and universities uh, watch out for these things. Yes, yes, definitely. So we have a question from Misha. In terms of your own background, can you tell us what some of your major influences have been in the history, literature, and academic disciplines of cultural ethnography? Wow. Um... That's a big question. <laughs> I, so I'm, uh, I'm influenced a lot by um, disabled scholars, other disabled scholars. I, I mean, I identify as disabled and that maybe wasn't clear up until now. I identify as disabled and so I, uh, I look up to a lot of other um, disabled scholars. And um, yeah, there's just like a really rich body of, of work that's been done. Um, I, yeah, it might be too late at night for me to start pulling names out. I'm sorry, but uh, I would love to have that chat offline if you want to reach out to me via email. <laughs> I'll send you some books. <laughs> uh, I've got I've got one final question, um, and more of a playful question. But uh, you know, you talk. Uh, some people aren't aren't familiar with BTS. Um, my parents are watching. I. <laughs> Dave and Gloria, um, and they may not know who BTS is. Can you explain some of the, the more playful things, how they engage their audience um, offline, online? Yeah, um, so a lot of the content that they put out, a lot of their posts, a lot of the videos that they post, they do a lot of live interactions, so like live video interactions. It's just all very playful. They're just, that. there's just humor and, um, kind of this you know it just yeah it's just very it's hard to describe it's just very playful um and funny there's like a lot of laughing that goes on um I feel like at least for those of us who identify as slightly older armies so not you know we're not in our 20s anymore I feel like there's a kind of it's nice because it gives us kind of youthful feel like you know we're all just here having fun um but it's all kind of infused with this sense of, of care and this idea of family. So it feels very, it's not just like slapstick humor. It's like very um, intimate, friendly humor that you kind of feel connected to. Mm -hmm. And ARMY then kind of takes that on and does it kind of re reapplies that outside the, those, you know, the content and kind of puts it out everyone there's a lot of interaction between so army will playfully take some content and then bts will see that and then they'll kind of like you know add on to it or they'll you know um they'll do a do a um sorry it's getting really late for my brain <laughs> they'll they'll uh they'll add yeah so they'll augment it or they'll 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 you know extend the joke or whatever it is anyway yeah no it's really fun okay <laughs> I think uh, on, on that note, uh, why don't we uh, conclude for the evening. I'd like uh, everybody to join me uh, thanking uh, Kate for this amazing uh, thought-provoking talk on, a, on I think a topic at least I haven't heard much about. So join me in a round of applause. Um, and with that, uh, again, um, my name is Mike, uh, along with my fellow organizers, David and April, who could not join us tonight. Um, I'm one of the volunteer organizers, uh, and if you like these, uh, please reach out. If you have any ideas for professors you'd love to hear from, uh, we'd love to get your ideas. Um, so once again, thank you, Kate, for sharing your research with us this evening. Uh, and I'll say, but to remind everyone, this talk has been recorded, uh, and it will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a few days, and we'll post the link to our social media. Uh, I'd also like to thank our amazing staff from the Alumni Relations Office and the University Events Office who organized this webinar. Thank you to Shana, Diana, Paulina, Kristen, and Kayla. Now, everybody, our next Slugs and Steins event will be Monday evening, November 14th, and it will feature photographer and associate professor 
uh, Carolina Karlich from the UCSC's art department. She will speak uh, on uh, photography and power, the seeds of a globalized modern world. Through a range of photographic media, uh, Professor Karlich creates work that addresses the intersection of photography and documentary practices with a focus on systems of labor and industry, globalization, and their impact on the social and environmental landscapes. Her research creates new work for the visual arts or new ways for the visual arts to deliver an act of criticism and to imagine the future. Uh, meanwhile, some other events you might be interested in. Uh, for those Baskin Engineering alumni in the audience, shout out. Uh, tomorrow evening, in fact, Baskin is holding its 21st, 25th anniversary celebration with an in-person event from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, you can, uh, another anniversary is for the, the, it's the 30th anniversary uh, uh, and we're celebrating the renaming of the Research Center for the Americas in honor of civil rights and feminist icon Dolores Huerta. Uh, go to events.ucsc.edu to register for both the Baskin event uh, and the Research Center for the Americas event. Um, I've heard that the uh, RCA event is in fact sold out, but uh, there is a waiting list. Uh, and I think there's a good chance you'll get in. So please, please go there and register if you're interested. Um, anybody who's going to the Baskin event, I'll be there. So I'll see you in person. Uh, also of note, the next Craw lecture on October 19th will feature Professor Michael Beck on how natural coastal habitats can be cost effective for building climate resilience. For more information, again, go to events.ucsc.edu. Another big event to support is the upcoming UCSC Giving Day. On this, this uh, year, it will be held on November 2nd. This is a one day kind of fundraising bonanza. You can go and, and look at all these cool um, campus organizations that are raising money. And I know it, for me, it's, it's difficult to pick. Um, again, second uh, of November. Um, I'll make a special plug for the Alumni Council's scholarship fund, which we raise money for. It has aided hundreds of worthy students who have limited financial resources. Uh, you can find out more about Giving Day at givingday.ucsc.edu and watch for our emails uh, and social media posts and, and please get involved. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us and please come back on November 14th at 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Good night, everybody.